Is anybody there? What the? Well, you better come in then. Mandarin is my name. Tell me yours. 
Oh, very well then. I shall call you Vavasaur. Now let's get that gear off. You can't be at all warm. I'll uh, hang it up by the cooker. I'll warm it up. Are you from the area? I said, are, are you from around here? Sit down, then. You'll warm up quickly in this chair, I guarantee it. It's a very happy chair to be in. Likes to hug. Down you go. Careful, though. If you drift, you can travel very far, very quickly in this chair. So, are you one of these uh, displaced citizens I've been reading about? No place to go, so you keep traveling? I couldn't do that myself. I'm afraid to leave all the comforts such as they are. Have you been to see the Queen? Carries herself well, that one does, considering she has to live in an apartment. I read in the paper she has to cook for herself. Though they send a cleaner in once a week to uh, Tidy up and do the laundry. <clears throat> ah, damn. I knew it would get cold. I'm going to heat up some more on the, on the cooker. Say, how about a nice cup of tea? Wouldn't that be grand? Descending this rope net. You've been traveling downward your whole life, working hard to keep pace with those around you. As far as you can see, left, right, up, down, people, countless numbers of people just like me and you. Mm -hmm. So here you are, right in the middle of everybody, and you figure. The end must be a few years off. So you think, what'll it be like? I mean, won't it be a gob of sunshine to finally be able to relax again? And you look up above and wave to some of your family. And think how elegant it'll be to visit with them once you're on the level. And you look past them and you see the rest of humanity descending. Hmm? Impossible to stop. The momentum alone wouldn't possibly allow it. And one day, you hear a clamoring from below. Hmm? Looks like things are beginning to jam up a bit. Screams. Huh? People yelling up at you, stop! They yell, stop! Huh? To your horror, you see folks falling. Lots of them. You yell up to those above you, stop, there's something wrong. Trouble is they can't stop. Nobody can. Hmm? Any one of us is like a pebble in a boulder slide. Down you're pushed. The sound of your heart is drowned out by the 
screams of tears of people below falling. Hmm. Nothing makes sense till you realize the truth. Not far below, the net ends. It just ends. Those people that are following it, they just disappear from you. And you plead, Dear God, stop! But it's for naught. Along you're pushed. Besides, what good would it do? Only one way to go is up. Who would have the strength to do that? Besides, there's not much time now. Will you struggle to hold on as long as you can? Uh, postponing the, for a moment, the inevitable? Perhaps let go now. Hmm? Vow not to scream. That would only add to the anguish of those still clinging to the only tangible thing they've ever known. That's how it seems to me, anyway. Sometimes. The scary thing is, I'd almost welcome it. Back when the churches were open, I once asked a vicar if he ever thought that God might have made a few mistakes. Well, he gnawed on that for a spell and started giggling. The giggling commenced to laughing, laughing so hard tears were squirting. That fellow never did answer. He walked away shaking his head. Never spoke to me again after that. I don't know if he was mad at me or God. It wasn't too much later that the uh, steeples and the crosses up and disappeared. You know what the funny thing was? Nobody said a word. It was like they'd never been there in the first place. Nobody told us all the rules, now did they? The people that made the rules and bickered over them all the time. <laughs> Bicker, vicar. sirens had a better hold on what they felt was theirs.
never did see that vicar again. I suppose he, he too went the way of the crosses. Makes you wonder if things will never go back to the way they were. Makes me wonder if the way things are is the way they were meant to be. You'll like this. The missus made this jam. She left a while ago. Early one morning. Said she wanted to go participate in the rites of spring. Never came back. Asked about the village for her. Nobody would admit to having seen her. Then or any time since. she might still come back when she's ready. You were hungry, weren't you? Reminds me of this time I watched a tiger hunting for a meal. I saw her peering through the thick fronds of the grass at the edge of this watering hole, inching ever closer to the edge of the clearing, never taking her eyes off of this herd of deer that had gathered to slake their thirst. There was this one, kind of off at a distance from the rest, a loner. I knew that tiger was going to pursue that one when she gave chase. There was this peacock up in the branches of this tree, watching the tiger move closer and closer. Before the tiger could get within range of a sure kill, that peacock squawked an alarm. All the tiger could do was watch its nourishment bound away. Well, she scanned the area. All the animals had scattered. With a low grumble deep from within her chest, she slunk back into the thick jungle. A few hours later, a noisy group of wild boars had gathered at the watering hole. Once again, the tiger appeared and pursued her supper. Once again, the peacock squawked an alarm and the pigs vanished. Twice more that tiger showed up, and twice more that peacock ruined the tiger's chances of finding a meal. When the peacock did that for the fifth time, daylight was drawing to a close. I swear that peacock was jeering from that branch high up in the tree. Away slunk the mighty cat, tired and hungry. The bird made no more noise that night. The sun rose on a nervous and irritable peacock after a night of fitful sleep. The peacock didn't relish leaving its safe perch. 
but the heat of the mid-morning sun had created a desperate thirst. After a few false starts, Peacock flew down to the edge of the water, but it had barely got a mouthful when it heard a rustling from behind. The peacock took off, desperate to get away. Up, up it flew, up to the top of the trees, grabbed onto a branch and turned to yell, Ha! to the cat. But the bird saw nothing. The bird scanned the area again and again, saw many animals, but no sign of the tiger. Not long after its heart had stopped pounding, the bird decided to try again. Down it went, uh, to the bank farthest from the dense thicket of the undergrowth. Tense, ready to take flight, the bird dipped its beak. A slight motion in the bushes to the right, the bird went skyward once again. This occurred twice more, and that bird's thirst grew. By midday, desperation had set in. Desperation will make a fool of both man and beast. Now finally, dehydration overcame fear, and the bird had decided it would take its chances no matter what, and drink. It left its perch, flew down to the water's edge. No more than two swallows, it heard the unmistakable pounding of the cat's paws as the feline charged. In a blind panic, the bird took off, but it made one horrible mistake. The peacock tried to take flight over the water. Its long, beautiful tail became waterlogged, too heavy for the peacock to gain lift. The tiger was on her nemesis immediately, and snared him in her mighty jaws. The bird went limp, catatonic, but the tiger wanted to savor the moment and resisted the urge to crush the life out of the bird. She stood there in the water, holding the body firmly in her jaws. She wanted that bird fully conscious when excruciating revenge was exacted. Well, eventually the bird woke up from the shock. He stared deeply into the dark, baleful eye of the tiger. He knew he was going to die. In one last action of spite, the bird plunged his beak into the eye of the tiger. The tiger bellowed with rage and tore that bird apart. Literally, there was nothing left of that bird but pieces that the very smallest of life would find and devour. The cat ran back into the forest, bellowing with rage, anger, hunger, frustration. Well, the silence induced by what had just occurred was short-lived. Life went back to normal at the watering hole. Much was lost. Nothing gained. Come with me. You need this more than I do. I used to enjoy bathing while listening to the player on the grind from the factory. It seemed to come off better with a little bit of music. You know, soothes the savage beast and all. Well, sir, bathing started to feel like a chore after that player broke down. <clears throat> Didn't care whether I was clean or not. Men at the factory started to complain. These men were big, strong muscles bulging. Veins looked like the roots of a blue tree tunneling under their skin. Hmm? 
One day, a bunch of them, they grabbed me, they drug me down to the river, and the blonde one, he told me, Naza Hypen. Then he picked me up and dumped me right in the water. Come up sputtering, coughing. Threw me a cake of soap, and as he was walking away, he looked back and said, Bleib draußen, bis du nicht mehr wie eine Sau stinkst. Well, so I washed myself as best I could through my clothes. Must have done okay. So they let me back in after that. I had to finish sweeping the floor and wearing these sopping clothes. Uh, took them the rest of the day to dry out. Ever have a time where you felt you weren't in control? Things you did didn't make sense? Well, I guess the worst for me was what I did to poor old Abernathy. He never done me no harm at all. Took him in after the missus had been gone for a spell. I missed having someone to talk to. I mean, not like at the factory. He don't talk about nothing but the factory. No old Abernathy. He'd stay up half the night with me. Even if I did talk both ears clean off. <laughs> Always seemed interested in what I had to say. Even that time I ate those moldy berries and started speaking in tongues. <laughs> well, he never let on there was anything amiss. Showed me respect, he did. I like that. Well, you remember that year the winter didn't want to end. That was right when they shut down the factory. No wages, food became mighty scarce. Well, folks started doing some unusual things. Anyway, Abernathy's and my stomach was empty most of the time. Hunger makes a man do things he wouldn't think about doing otherwise. I had to eat. There just wasn't enough food for both of us. So I took Abernathy out to the yard. And shared some of the last bread I had in the pantry. He even put some of that jam on it for him. And he liked that old Abernathy did. His last meal and all. I suspect that somewhere down the road, I'm gonna have to own up to what I did that day. I, there'll come a time when I have to take a look at myself and who I've been. A day of reckoning, I suppose. I think it'll be like looking at one of those uh, circus mirrors, you know, the ones that make you look all bendy and squiggly. Except this one won't be lying. I'll be seeing, seeing all the things I didn't want to look at before. All the times I bent the rules in my favor. All the times I squiggled my way out of responsibility. And everybody I ever wronged will gather and have a look-see. Maybe there's enough time yet to iron out some of these imperfections. Here. Put some of these clothes on. They're clean enough.
This reminds me of right before little Pittsburgh wanted to learn how to dry and dress himself. Up to that point, he'd always been so cooperative, always smiling, proud to be growing into such a big boy. And then he decides he wants to become Mr. Independent. Didn't want me touching his things anymore. Nothing seemed to please him. Everything I did or said set wrong with him. Even after he'd grown up. He happened on a bunch of money one day. I don't know whether honestly or not. I do recollect it was a healthy sum. He kept this money in a cardboard box in the closet on the shelf. Nearly four years, he never touched it. Then one day he says it's cold. So he takes that box of money down, puts it in the middle of the floor. Damn if he didn't set fire to it. <laughs> I'm just standing there. I didn't know what to say, so I didn't say anything. And pretty soon the whole house is full of smoke. I can't stand it anymore, so I go outside. But Pittsburgh stays there, right in the thick of it. After a while he comes out. Skin and clothes all smeared with soot. And he just walks off without saying a word. I never heard from him again. I did hear he started an underground theater company, gained some notoriety, producing these dark plays performed by unknown actors, plots nobody understood. And yet, people still flocked to see his stuff because it was so different. I did see a photo of him in the paper. He was grinning ear to ear. Well done. Well done. You'll catch on quickly. Sit. Now this house can be a mite peculiar at times. The odd creek accepted. Sometimes I can feel it thinking. No, not thinking. Pondering. That's it, pondering. Digesting all it's seen throughout its life. You know how people say if these walls could only speak? Well, on the one hand, I might enjoy the company. I might not be happy to hear what it had to say, on the other hand. Do you understand everything that I've told you? Do you? Very well, then. We shan't delay this any longer. Right. Now there's 
plenty of food in the pantry. There's even another crock of that jam. 